Good morning and welcome to the Family Church. I don't have a lot of announcements today. We could still use another family or two to volunteer for a week of mowing at the Family Church. Um, just takes an hour or so if with two people and you can use the riding mower and push mower at church. Um, follow the link in the announcement email or contact me and we can get you set up with one of the remaining weeks. We have some joys this week, uh, mostly just that everybody who's been having surgeries and getting sick seems to be recovering, me included, having a much better day today, so I'm grateful for that. Concerns, I guess the main one is just the continued effects of racism. We may be insulated from it in our community, and most of the people here are white, and we don't see a lot of racism, and we're not really at risk of being in the path of a riot here. So it seems far away from us, but it doesn't mean we can't be helpful or that we're not a part of it. I think it's important that we pay attention to the, the numbers, the statistics, and the stories that show us that it is a real problem, that we do need to care. We do need to do something about it. We need to raise our kids with a passion for equality and live our own lives the expectation that we don't know it all, we're not perfect, we might not think we're racist, but we all have a little bit of bias in us. We need to learn and be sympathetic to people who are hurt and be praying for unity, for solutions, for healing for people who have been harmed and continue to be harmed. Let's take a minute in prayer. God, we thank you for being our God and for loving all of us, for loving all of us equally. Help us to bring about a world of justice where all people are treated equally, where all people are cared for, protected, in ways that reflect you. Help us to be a part of justice. Help us to be a part of loving all. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to take just a minute now to recognize a few people connected to our church who are graduating from whatever level it might be. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant.
mosquitoes are horrible, as if this year hasn't been bad enough. Now we've got millions of marauding mosquitoes. Mmm, mosquitoes are delicious. Every frog's dream is a bumper crop of mosquitoes. Really? You guys eat mosquitoes? It doesn't seem like they would make much of a meal. Well, I eat about a hundred insects a day. They add up. I eat some, toads eat some, dragonflies eat some, bats eat a lot of them. Whoa, what's up with your eyes? I'm just looking around for something to eat. That's really weird. Please stop. You know, with so many things eating mosquitoes, it's a wonder why there are still so many of them. Well, we're all kind of spread out. Toads usually just hang around gardens. Bats like wooded areas and caves. I like to hang out near water, cause I'm an amphibian. Oh, you're amphibious? My sister's amphibious. She can write her name with either hand. Huh? Hey, you know what? You could organize a bunch of frogs and toads and other animals that eat mosquitoes and form a union. You could all gather at a certain place, let's say my backyard, and eat all the mosquitoes. Then, after you've eaten all the mosquitoes, just move on to the next place. I don't know. I knew a guy who was a union organizer and it didn't work out so well for him. That was my uncle, Jimmy Hoppa. Come on, Jerry. I've known you since you were just a clump of eggs in that pond. Even before you were a tadpole, I knew you had a special purpose. When you had that big head and the tiny little legs and that weird vestigial tail, I knew you were destined for greatness. You're laying it on a little thick, don't you think? Besides, I don't speak very well. My tongue is a third the length of my body. I'm just a frog. Don't say you're just a frog. I'm telling you, you can talk to all the animals and not be afraid. Even the bats? Even the bats. Jerry, this is your destiny. Is your tongue really a third the length of your body? That's like if someone were five feet tall, their tongue would be 20 inches long. Just think of the possibilities. You can get every last drop of a milkshake. You can get all the crumbs out of the bottom of a Pringles can. You could hold a flashlight and still have both hands free. You could use it to eat bugs and grasshoppers. Um, yeah, I guess so. Well, let's go write our speech. Okay, but can you make me a milkshake first with extra crickets? We believe that God calls all of us. We're all called to follow. To be an example for our families and the world around us. We're all called to help out with our church, to serve the community, and to share our faith with others. And there are some people who are called to do more. Sometimes God actually tells someone what to do. My mom is a retired pastor. She was a guest speaker here at the family church once. When I was in college, she was married to another pastor. My great uncle is a pastor. My dad, among other things, was the director of one of the United Methodist camps. I was active in my United Methodist church, a choir, a bell choir. I never missed a youth group activity. But I had no interest in ever working in a church. I had seen how my mom was sometimes caught in difficult situations, how the church could be full of conflict. I saw some people with very non-Christian motives. They wanted power or to advance their agendas, or they were taking out their frustrations on the pastor. It was really about something from home or work. I was in engineering school. I liked electronics, and I imagined learning more about how to design circuits. I had friends who were happy working as engineers, so it made sense for me. And then one day in the shower, God told me to change paths. There were no detailed instructions, there was no booming voice, but for a few seconds that one time in my life I heard a clear message from God. I was in my freshman year of college. I was enjoying myself, learning a lot. This was very disruptive. I had a plan. And I was at a state school, not a Christian school. And I was young. I hadn't even turned 18 yet. I didn't want to join in the frustrations of the pastors that I knew well. I had been to a couple of the Christian groups on campus, you know, campus life, that sort of thing. And I really didn't fit in there. It felt different and awkward to me. 
let's see, what other excuses did I have? Oh, I liked science, and I wasn't sure how to reconcile my scientific and logical way of thinking with my faith. And I was pretty sure that ministry was going to screw up my chances with girls. There were probably more excuses after those. Well, I went and talked to the pastor at the Methodist Church across the street from campus, and he brought up this scripture. It really did help me realize that Jeremiah had it worse than I did. When God talked to Jeremiah, he was only 12. That was six years younger than I was. Jeremiah was afraid of public speaking. I was a recent state forensics champion. I loved public speaking. Jeremiah was worried about how people would respond when he called them out and told them what they were doing wrong. I knew that there might be times I might make church people upset, but for the most part, I would probably be accepted. Church people want to have a pastor. Jeremiah's crowd often didn't want him around or to hear what he had to say. When God talked to Jeremiah, the risks were bigger. God was asking him to overturn the order of the world. God was only asking me to consider a career in some kind of ministry and maybe run into some church conflict. Jeremiah was asked to rely on charity to survive, I was being asked to try a career that would pay me, less than I would earn as an engineer. There was one upside. I would be able to drop Calculus 2 before it even started and take something more interesting. Jeremiah's call was a bigger deal than any call from God most of us will ever experience. He was young, unproven, didn't know what his abilities were yet. He had no experience. And as a prophet would be putting his life in danger. And the world was far more dangerous for him than it is for us. God probably won't speak directly to most people in our lifetimes. I'm not expecting it to happen again to me. But God does put opportunities in front of us. Times when we can stand up for God or for God's people. Chances to share our faith. To support someone in trouble. You might be called to tell a person or a group that what they're doing is wrong and that you want to help them change. When God calls us, most of our excuses are just that. Excuses. If you meet someone in need and feel like you're not sure if you're supposed to help them, but your spouse's excuse is, he just got out of prison for murder. Maybe we shouldn't invite him into our home with our young children, at least not with that bag of chainsaws. That might be a good excuse. I'm afraid of what my neighbors might think is not a good excuse. The most common excuse when God is calling us to do something is some form of, I'm not good enough. It comes out a lot of different ways. I'm too young. I don't know how. I've done too many wrong things in my past, so I'm not good enough. I'm not successful or important enough. I'm just a regular person. There are so many ways we put ourselves down and believe we're not good enough. Low self-esteem can come from parents, bullies in school, bad bosses, or ourselves. The thing is, God knows what we're capable of. God doesn't ask us to do things we cannot do. The excuses that say, I'm not good enough to serve God, don't work with God. God asks us based on our potential, not based on our past mistakes or failures or our own self-doubt. God asks us to do things we will be able to do well, even if we don't have experience with them. And it doesn't matter if you're 12 or if you're 72 in that case. If God is asking you to do something you've never done, well, it's kind of like doing it when you're 12, like Jeremiah had to. God knows you can do it. God asks us to do things that are hard. If it was something that came easy to us, something we do all the time, God wouldn't have to ask. But doing something we haven't done before something we're not comfortable with, something we doubt we can do, 
The benefit of doing it for God is that it challenges us and makes us closer to God. God might ask you to do something at any time. One day in the shower or in the grocery line, during worship on a Sunday, it's often a surprise. When it happens, the natural human thing to do is make excuses. Jeremiah did. Moses did. Jonah did. Even Jesus did. My prayer for you today is that when the moment arises, you have a nagging memory of Pastor Mike telling you to consider saying yes. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to open with a song. It's called Surrender. Share. 